My name's Stephen Kirshner. I'm a research fellow at the Centre for Independent Studies. And I'm in conversation with Larry White, who's a professor of economics at George Mason University. And he's also the author of The Clash of Economic Ideas. And he's been at CIS talking about his book. Uh, welcome, Larry. Thank you, Steve. So you begin your book uh, introducing the ideas of Keynes and Hayek, and you use Keynes and Hayek as an introduction to, or as exemplars for uh, two different traditions in um, the battle of economic ideas. Uh, looking back historically, who do you think was the more influential? Well, clearly so far, Keynes has been the more influential uh, over the past hundred years. Keynes advocated a larger role for government and was more favorable toward uh, some kinds of planning, uh, but certainly a more activist government management of the macroeconomy. Hayek stood for a more limited role of government and uh, stronger constraints on central banks and uh, monetary policy. And clearly government has grown in the last hundred years. Uh, so Keynes has been more influential. Uh, all the growth hasn't been directly due to his ideas, but to some extent it has. Uh, but you know the, the debate goes on, and Hayek's ideas have uh, at least made a comeback uh, in the debate, in the discussion. They're, they're being heard again. So there's some hope that Keynes's influence will begin to wane and uh, Hayek's will grow. So do you think Keynes was a more effective public intellectual than Hayek, that he was a, a better communicator of ideas? Or was it more that he had a, a message that was more appealing to policymakers? I think it's a bit of both. Keynes was a much better writer than Hayek, <laughs> at least in English. I can't judge Hayek's German, but uh, Keynes was a very witty writer. He had, you know, beautiful turns of phrase. Uh, he's very quotable, very memorable phrases. But uh, in many cases, the ideas he was communicating were half-baked ideas. Uh, and, and I'm thinking in particular of the, his famous book, The General Theory, which is very hard to make sense of. And when you do make sense of what he's saying, you're sa you say, how could he believe that? That can't possibly be right. And I think Hayek very effectively refuted him, but in a way that appealed to economists rather than to policymakers. Uh, and in the, in the public arena, Hayek was not so effective. Uh, until he sort of stopped talking about monetary policy and wrote The Road to Serfdom, and that, uh, had, that was a bestseller. It did have some resonance. Um, and so Hayek sort of became a political philosopher at that point. So after the stagflation of the 1970s, there was a move away from Keynesian ideas, and there was a shift towards more market-oriented and, and rules-based approaches to things like monetary and fiscal policy. Right. But with the most recent financial crisis, the pendulum is, seems to have swung back the other way, and Keynesianism seems to be uh, resurgent once again. Uh, do you think it's the case that bad economic ideas or more interventionist economic ideas thrive in bad economic times? Well, I think there is something to that, because you hear this from the public, uh, we have to do something. And uh, Keynesians say, well, we have a prescription. We, we we can tell you what to do. And those who say, you know, it's better not to intervene if you're not sure what you're doing or if you're, uh, your ideas are half-baked and the market will cure itself if you stop mucking around with it, uh, that's not as saleable an idea, at least uh, until the populace uh, gets more attuned to the ideas, to the sort of long-run wisdom. If people are uh, not thinking in a long-run way, then uh, I mean, one of my colleagues argues that the, the political process sort of encourages wishful thinking, uh, mm -hmm. then you can get policy based on wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. You're known as an advocate of free banking as opposed to central banking. And if we look at the United States today, the, the Federal Reserve and its role in the economy is certainly being questioned politically, if not intellectually. Uh, where do you think that's going to go? Do you think there's going to be a change in the monetary institutions or the monetary regime in the, in the United States? And what change uh, would you expect? There doesn't seem to be any strong movement right now. When 
Before Ben Bernanke became chairman of the Fed, he was an advocate of inflation targeting. Not of a very strict sort, but that at least would, that, under that, of course, the Fed would announce what its inflation target was, and it could be held accountable for it. So it would provide some uh, accountability, some constraint, at least uh, an embarrassment constraint on uh, wild swings in policy. But since he became chairman of the Fed, we haven't heard much about inflation targeting anymore. Uh, but the, I mean, the FOMC has uh, moved towards inflation targeting a little bit, though, in the sense that they now have this, this guidance that they're issuing in terms of they did, uh, yes. the inflation forecast and, and interest rates. So they've, they've moved to more transparency about what the range of opinion within the Monetary Policy Committee is, which is a good thing mm. uh, for people in the market who are trying to anticipate uh, what's coming next. But and there has been some talk about changing the Fed's mandate so that it has less wiggle room. It has a single objective instead of a dual mandate. But I don't know how much traction that's going to have. Uh, with the exception of a few uh, people like Ron Paul, most congressmen are very deferential to Federal Reserve officials when they come to testify. And the Federal Reserve officials do know more about monetary policy than any particular person in the Congress does. So it's very easy to just delegate. Uh, and then if things go well, Congress can take credit. And if things go badly, they can blame the Fed. And that seems to have been the, the bargain they've struck over the years in exchange for the Fed's independence. Mm. If, do you think the Fed's role in the financial crisis and in responding to the financial crisis in some ways has been exaggerated? I mean, if you look at economists like uh, Jeff Rogers Hummel and David Henderson, mm -hmm. they would argue that monetary policy leading up to the uh, crisis seems to be fairly endogenous to economic activity. And then you have people like Eugene Farmer who would say that uh, the uh, Fed's balance sheet is simply too small uh, for it to have much effect on, on market interest rates. Uh, I'm not in that school. I think the Fed had an important impact in keeping interest rates too low for too long. There, you can see some movement in long-term interest rates resulting from what's known as the global savings glut. But I don't think that can explain how uh, short-term interest rates went from five and a quarter percent to one percent. And I think that has to be the Fed. And that changed the kind of mortgages people were writing. Floating rate mortgages became much more popular because they were such, so much cheaper than uh, long-term fixed rate mortgages. So I think the Fed had an impact in that way. I, it's not only the Fed. There were also bad regulations to, designed to put everybody in a mortgage that uh, led to weakness in the banking system. But um, I, I think uh, the, the Fed was partly responsible. I think you can see it in the monetary data. Uh, not solely responsible. And of course, the, the theoretical ideal is kind of subtle, I mean, or the theoretical uh, notion that interest rates should be kept at the equilibrium rate or the natural rate, because you can't observe the equilibrium rate or the natural rate. Okay. So it, it's always to some extent a judgment call. But um, I think the evidence is pretty strong that the Fed pursued an overly expansionary, uh, too cheap credit policy for a number of years. And that was a big contributor to the housing bubble. So if I could ask you to look into your crystal ball, uh, where do you see the clash of economic ideas heading for, from here? Do you think uh, more market-oriented ideas are going to prevail, or do you think more interventionist ideas are going to pre prevail, or do we keep going back and forth for another 100 years? Uh, like the rap song says, we've been going back and forth for a century. Um, I'm not really a forecaster of ideas. I'm a historian of ideas. Uh, but I, uh, it's hard to spot a trend, I think. I, I think free market ideas have made a comeback in the sense that they're now discussed respectfully in academia, where 40, 50 years ago that wasn't true. Uh, there are certainly uh, a lot of Nobel laureates in, in economics who I would count among my uh, intellectual heroes who are very staunchly free market thinkers and have contributed enormously to uh, positive economics as well. So they have some, some prestige and some cachet. Uh, so I think. Uh, Free market economics is not going to uh, disappear. Uh, I hope it grows relative to uh, interventionist economics. And I think the arguments about public goods and externalities will sort of continue to be the battleground. Uh, 
but how it turns out uh, it sort of depends on the, the next generation of economists. Watch this space. Thank <laughs> you very much for talking to us, Larry White. My pleasure.